Everything seemed surreal, like the night before had been a dream. Maria walked into the breakfast room and saw her cousin Eleanor waiting for her. On seeing her cousin, Eleanor sprang from the table. Her cousin's face was deathly pale. Her eyes were swollen and bloodshot and her body was trembling. She couldn't hide the horror on her face. It was June 1676 and Maria was busying herself in her rooms and talking to her cousin Eleanor when they heard a call come from the outer gate. Both ladies rose and went to the window. In the changing colours of the twilight they recognised the voice of Jem Hazelden, who was the carrier from Manchester. The ladies made their way downstairs to greet him. As they got to the door Jem was lifting down a dirty wooden box from one of his pack horses and told them that he had come by wagon, all the way from London. Excited, Maria thought it might be a present from her brother, who had been staying in London for a year or two. Before saying his farewells and leaving, Jem turned and gave Maria a battered and creased little envelope. She stood there, examining the handwriting as Jem passed over the moat and headed back towards Manchester. Something wasn't right. The writing was quaint, but was wrote too closely together, making the words difficult to read. This letter was definitely not from her brother. This made her feel anxious and uneasy. She turned the letter over and over in her pale small hands, but no other clues could be found as to who the author or of the letter's contents. She felt almost afraid to open it and to find out. But as it was getting late and the light was dimming, she decided to open the letter and the box tomorrow. A few hours later, Maria went to bed, but she could not sleep. She lay there listening to the wind and the rain battery in the hall as she lay there thinking about the letter in the box. Just then, she realised the rain had stopped. But the wind was blowing more violently than before, creating unnatural sounds howling through the great hall. She looked over at the mysterious box. The wind had cleared the sky from the clouds and moonbeams filled the room, lighting up the dirty wooden box. She noticed it was tied round with a bit of hemp cord and fastened with a few rusty nails. Her heart throbbed violently and she could hardly resist the horrible desire or the impulse to leap forward and view the contents. She called for Dick to come and take the box down to a vacant outbuilding to be opened. And as they went, Betty, a housemaid, tagged along and following behind. The box was broken open, but when Maria looked inside, she relaxed. It looked like it was just packed with straw. But Dick noticed something. As he said, there's blood. He removed a few handfuls of straw and then no one could believe what they were looking at. Maria had the item buried beneath a sycamore tree. The next morning, walked into the kitchen, pale and trembling. And upon seeing her cousin Eleanor, she told her everything. Her brother, Roger Downs, who was the last male representative of his family and was a royalist, a courtier of Charles II, but also a man who liked his drink and had a wild temper. And at the age of 28 years, he was known as, quote, one of the wildest blades in court. And one night after becoming drunk, he staggered along the street and drew his sword, swearing that he would kill the first man he met. And unfortunately, he came upon a poor tailor who he killed on the spot, running him through with his weapon. <gasps> he was arrested, but because of his connections at court, he was granted a free pardon. And immediately, he continued with his violent ways. Getting drunk again, and passing over London Bridge, he engaged in another confrontation. He ran his sword through a watchman, <gasps> but a second watchman landed his bill on Roger's neck, and with one blow, severed his head from his body. A bill, crudely put, is a large curved axe on a pole. Roger's body was thrown over the bridge into the Thames and his head was put in a dirty wooden box and nailed shut. This was sent to his sister. And that's the box that Maria opened and buried under the sycamore tree. It was her brother's head. However, in 1779, this famous story was disproved 
when Roger Downs' coffin was opened and his head was still attached to his body. It's argued that someone else is buried there, but this is unlikely. But there is a skull that resides at Wardley Hall and many believe that this skull belongs to Father Ambrose Barlow, a Benedictine monk, born in Manchester in 1585 as Edward Barlow. He took the name Ambrose when he became a monk and as the Catholic faith was banned at this period, Father Ambrose and others like him preached in secret, hiding away using tunnels and passages known as priest holes, which are special places and sometimes rooms where a family can hide a priest when soldiers come looking for them. But unfortunately, word got out about this location on an Easter Sunday, 1641, in the middle of a sermon, Father Barlow was arrested, beaten, and dragged off to Lancaster Castle by angry Protestants. He had a trial of sorts, but it was going through the motions. Everyone already knew the outcome. Father Barlow did not deny his actions, and the judge handed him a death sentence, which was common at the time. On the 10th of September, 1641, Father Barlow was led up to the scaffold and hanged in front of a large cheering crowd. But just before he died from hanging, he was cut down. And while he was still alive, he was hacked into four pieces. His flesh was boiled in tar and his head was mounted on a spike outside the castle. This was later placed in Manchester Church as a warning to people of Manchester. But his cousin rescued the skull and hid it away in Wardley Hall. But due to being martyred for his faith, he was canonised and became St Ambrose Edward Barlow, known as one of the 40 martyrs of England and Wales. It is also important to note that Ambrose was related to the Downs family. And now I know what you're thinking. Why would you keep a skull in your home for three centuries? Well, that is because this skull, Father Barlow's remains, are known as the Screaming Skull of Wardley Hall. It is said that because of such a violent, horrific past, the former spirit is still furious and remains trapped within the skull. For years, the final agonising shrieks of Father Barlow have been heard ringing through the hall. At first, the screaming of the old building couldn't be located, but during renovations in the 18th century, Francis, the third Duke of Bridgewater, discovered the skull secretly stashed away behind a panel at the top of the stairs. Utterly disgusted, he grabbed the skull and he threw it into the moat. And that evening, a storm raged, but like nothing before, toppling trees and battering the manor. It roared for hours, terrifying all inside. The Duke ordered the moat to be drained and the skull to be retrieved. The Duke was the first person recorded who tried removing the skull but he wouldn't be the last. Disturbed either by its presence alone or by the distant blood-curdling screams which emanated from the skull throughout the night, many others made the attempt. But both accounts of the monk and the drunken royalists are the same. Every time the skull has been burned, buried, smashed into pieces, the macabre object is always found outside the hall the next day, wearing its eternal grin leaving some thinking that the skull is indestructible. And it's said the skull never failed to punish the individual severely who should dare lay hands on it, with supernatural things happening after it had been disturbed. Wardley Hall is a listed building, with the current building dating from the 1500s, but the moat dates to at least 1292. You can visit the hall today, but you need to book first. And yes, the skull is still there. Well, that'll be all for today. If you like that story, let me know in the comments below. And if you're new here, don't forget to like and subscribe. I upload new content every Wednesday. Thanks for watching. Take care.